Okay. Are we rolling? We are. And we're recording. So hi, everybody. This is Harvey Sulga Wasserman. This is the 121st uh, Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition call. We're on uh, December 19th. Uh, and I want to, uh, 2022, we're going to say farewell to 2022 today. And we are going to lay down for future listeners and students of election protection. Uh, this one hour will be somewhat of a a tutorial or a, uh, a prospectus on our campaigning for the next two years. The Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition is otherwise known as Grassroots EP 2024, uh, Election Protection 2024. So we are committed for the next two years to fight for uh, to protect our elections. And there are about 20 different points um, where we are touching down to work directly on election protection I'm going to lay them down now in quick academic form, and then we're going to go back through them and make sure we all understand what we got. We will have, this will be transcribed. It will be available with a link uh, at our website, grassrootsep.org, and it's going to be the template from which we work for the next two years to protect our elections so that we have an actual democracy. And I will say by way of history, that this election protection movement, at least in its modern incarnation, kind of was born at the Florida 2000 election with uh, the work of Greg Pallas showing uh, the, the thievery and the stripping of the voter rolls and uh, Bev Harris uh, going into the computers, the, the theft of computerized voting, especially in Volusia County. She called it black box voting. Uh, it then really rose in uh, Ohio 2004 where Bob Fatrakis, a political scientist at Columbus State Community College, showed about, about a hundred different ways that Carl Rove came into action, primarily through electronic voting machines. And I was fortunate enough to kind of be uh, 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 Bob's uh, stenographer there. And we put out a whole bunch of articles and that on the internet, and that really got things going. In fact, the, a week before the 2004 election, our article, 11 Different Ways George Bush is Stealing the 2004 Election, was number one worldwide on the internet. And that really got, got the movement going uh, through uh, 2016, where, where there were major challenges um, uh, to the, uh, the so-called victory of Donald Trump. And finally, in 2018, <clears throat> the perfect storm hit. And our campaign, which the number one issue in the election protection movement, from the beginning in 2000 until today has been hand counted, hand marked, uh, hand counted digital or digitally scanned paper ballots. And I will tell you without a doubt that in the 2018 election and in the 2020 presidential and in the 2022 off a year, second off year election, that the outcome of the elections in the United States of America was completely shaped by hand-marked, digitally scanned paper ballots. And the outcomes would have been very different. So on our agenda, and without, without those ballots, so on our agenda, going into 2024, the number one issue, the number one <coughs> um, uh, agenda item in our activism, and the, the point of telling this is to emphasize that our activism on election protection has made a difference. I will again reiterate, of course, we had the perfect storm in 2018 to, through 22, which is the COVID. And in 2018, as you'll recall, people really did not want to vote in person. And so ballots were, paper ballots were mailed out. More than 80% of the American public in 2018 and in 2020 um, voted on paper ballots. And that has been the product of the election protection activism movement in this country and that's what we intend to carry forward to 2024 and so the basics and we have the great Ray Lutz on here who's <clears throat> going to talk to us later about auditing but the ballots uh, of the, that we are advocating for going into 2024 we want um, uh, more than 90 percent of the country there will be people who be people uh, with uh, challenges who can't use paper ballots we understand that 
but we want the vast majority, virtually everyone to be voting on hand marked paper ballots that are either mailed back, they're dropped in boxes, or they're taken into the election centers and deposited by hand so that people know that their ballots have gone in and are being counted. And we want them digitally scanned. Now, this is another part of the struggle, but people argue that hand, hand marked paper ballots cause a slowdown in the reporting. We want all paper ballots digitally scanned. The scans can be counted. The results can come from them. If they're within a margin and raise the expert on this, there will be uh, recounts or audits. Um, uh, but we will have an electronic record of all uh, digital, all hand and mark paper ballots and the ability to count them very rapidly because they're digitally scanned. And that is the gold standard that we are fighting for in the 24 election. <clears throat> and we've, it's a victory that our movement has won in 2018, 2020, and 22. And we wanna make sure that it's a permanent feature of the American electoral system that you get in the mail, or if you wanna go in and get it in person, a paper ballot, you mark that paper ballot, you send it back in either through the mail in a drop box or in person, it is digitally scanned. And, and then if there are recounts, they go against the digital scan. That's the bottom line. That's the first agenda uh, item in our activism going forward. So, um, and, and as you will recall, there was quite a bit of yelling and screaming against ballots being mar mailed out, but we want ballots mailed to every registered voter as, in, as is done already in a number of states, including California. Second, second item, we do not want required photo ID or other potentially discriminatory requirements for getting a ballot. Uh, a photo ID is discriminatory. There are plenty of other ways to do it without photo ID, and that's, that's what we want. We do not want mass challenges to be allowed uh, to disqualify voters, as we have seen even more than the recent um, uh, runoff in, in Georgia. Greg Palace has done a basic reporting on this. He has a movie on it called Vigilante, which we strongly recommend. But the idea that voters can be challenged en masse in the tens of thousands is absolutely uh, antithetical to a real democracy. We do not want that to be allowed and we have to be very wary of it being thrown at us. So no mass challenges. Um, Ex-felons. Ex-felons absolutely should have the right to vote. In Florida, as you all know, I'm sure there was a, a referendum, a public referendum, which passed overwhelmingly to allow ex-felons to vote. More than a million in Florida were qualified by this referendum to vote, and the, uh, the Florida legislature intervened and made all sorts of financial and other requirements, which we, we believe absolutely should not be allowed under the law. And this um, um, attack on the right of ex-felons to vote in Florida had a definite impact, as Wendy Lederman can report from Florida, had a definite impact on the outcomes in Florida. And uh, this, we, as a movement, uh, we strongly oppose. I do wanna emphasize, by the way, we are 501c3. We are nonpartisan and we don't support either party. We critique both parties on these calls. We've had both Republicans and Democrats and, Mo and Gre Greens as we have with Howie Hawkins. So uh, we, we are uh, nonpartisan, but this, this thing of uh, uh, disqualifying ex-felons is absolutely, it's a holdover from the Confederacy when, the, when uh, white people would just grab black people off the street and convict them of crimes and deprive them of their right to vote. That needs to be in the past. So. That's a big part of it, of what we advocate. We also advocate the reinstitution of the Voting Rights Act. As you all know, the uh, Voting Rights Act was gutted in the Shelby decision by the Roberts, uh, John Roberts Supreme Court. And uh, the voting right, it allowed for federal intervention into elections where there was obvious discrimination, mostly on the basis of race. And uh, the Voting Rights Act was one with the blood of the civil rights movement signed in 1965 
overturned in the 2010s, that cannot happen. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to have the reinstitution <coughs> of the Voting Rights Act. We want same day voter registration. We want people who are not registered to be able to show up at the polls and register and vote <coughs> right then and there. <coughs> We also want registration available, voter registration, at least the forms to be available at schools, motor vehicle bureaus, social security offices, uh, unemployment offices, and so on. So that we want to make it as easy as possible for legitimate uh, citizens and registered voters or, or people to get registered, especially young people. We want uh, 30 days, minimum 30 days of early voting. You know, uh, there has been in the last 20 years, largely due to the efforts of our movement, uh, a vast expansion of the window for voting. And we saw pushback, of course, in Georgia in this most recent runoff where the, uh, the state apparatus uh, got rid of uh, voting on the Sunday before the Tuesday election, which is outrageous. That needs to be protected. And uh, uh, we want as much early voting as possible so the people and, and on weekends so that people can vote who have jobs. Because as you know, when you turn up to vote, in many cases, uh, the lines are long. And if uh, in, the, in the past, when we've had only one day for voting, uh, it was completely discriminatory against working people. So we want as big an early voting window as possible and certainly protection of uh, the, the, previous, the prior weekend <laughs> so that the... Uh, the non-Jews can vote on Saturday and the Jews can vote on Sunday. And um, we also want election day to be a national holiday. Uh, we actually early on advocated a four day weekend for voting. For the, uh, so there will be Saturday, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, the, the constitution calls for election day to be the first Tuesday after the first Monday um, of an election year. That means if the first Tuesday is the first, uh, you don't do it. Then if Monday, so that, that you can go from the second to the eighth, let's put it that way, on the Tuesday. We would like a certainly a national holiday for election day, but also uh, a four day weekend. That's a little bit of a, a big ask, but let's start with at least uh, a national holiday for election day. Um, <laughs> because there are lines, we, we saw the state of Georgia do the outrageous thing of passing a law, a felony uh, against giving people waiting in line to vote food and water. It's absolutely outrageous. Uh, and, and, and people got around it uh, this, um, during the runoff this time by setting up food stands uh, exactly 150 feet from the poll. The law said you can't give food and water to somebody 150 feet from the pole. So there were taco stands and hot dogs and uh, it was probably better than ever 150 feet away. We believe that people standing in line to vote should be provided with porta potties, folding chairs, food, water, protective cover against bad weather. Um, it, you know, it, it's outrageous that people should have to stand in line to vote in this country. It makes no sense. And we even had in Georgia, uh, they removed the drop boxes so that e if you had your ballot already filled out, you had to stand in line just to drop it off. It's outrageous. So uh, as I say, we want our voters to be catered to, provided with chairs, provided with porta potties, food and shelter. Absolutely no reason uh, not to. Here's a, a, a very big one. Uh, I don't want it to go by in passing as if it's equal to all the others. And that's Citizens United. We want money, corporate money, banned from our elections. Now, there have been a series of laws passed, Buckley versus Vallejo uh, and others intended, uh, well, they were overturned by that, but there have been a series of laws which were intended to keep money out of politics. And they, there are four major court decisions that overturn them. I won't mention them here, but we'll put them in, in the record. Buckley Vallejo was one of them. Um, uh, uh, Bilotti was another one, which was written by Lewis Powell. And uh, the, um, uh, we're, uh, we're not gonna take hands yet, but we'll, Mary, we'll get to the end. Um, and so 
uh, we want money out of politics. We want the Supreme Court decisions, particularly C Citizens United, which uh, banned the ability of the citizenry to, to control money in politics. We want those Supreme Court decisions reversed. There is a major a movement called Move to Amend, which aims to uh, get rid of Citizens United and to amend the Constitution of the United States to prevent corporations and, and rich people from buying our elections. Uh, uh, money is not speech. Money is money. And as Bob Dylan said, uh, money doesn't talk, it swears. So we want money out of politics, and that is a major piece uh, uh, of our campaigning. So, and, and certainly no corporate contributions to partisan campaigns or parties and disallow PACs. These PACs are a, a, a game. Uh, there was an act passed, by the way, US Congress passed the Tillman Act in 1907 or 1908, which was aimed at keeping money and, and banning corporate contributions. And, um, and that's got to stop, okay? We're joined by Ray McClendon. Ray, if you'll give me a couple of minutes to finish here, I want to come to you to wrap up to talk about the need to move uh, our money from, uh, from the political parties to grassroots organizations <clears throat> for getting out the vote. So let me finish this list. Ray McClendon of the Atlanta and uh, Georgia NAACP has joined us uh, most of the way through here. Um, strict limits, of course, on personal contributions as well as corporations. Um, uh, as for the Voting stations, uh, no, uh, uh, no guns anywhere near the polling stations. Um, uh, we're not gonna make gun control our major issue here. Uh, I hate guns and um, uh, the second amendment, as far as I'm concerned is being radically misinterpreted, but certainly no guns within a half mile, any polling station. Gerrymandering, gerrymandering is a very, very big deal. We spend a lot of time on it, <clears throat> it has shaped the U.S. House and the um, legislatures uh, throughout the country, state legislatures, gerrymandering needs to be abolished. As most of you know, the term gerrymandering came in 1812. A guy named Elbridge Gerry was the governor of Massachusetts. He drew the congressional lines to favor his Jeffersonian party, and they were so whacked out that the, the pundits at the time said they look like salamanders. And that's where the term gerrymander comes from. We want our districts to look like democratic, small d Democrat districts uh, where people actually have the right to vote and one person's vote counts the same as another per person's, which is not the case as you well know. Um, and it has locked up our state legislatures and the US House in ways that are entirely undemocratic, small d, that needs to be changed and we know we can do it. <clears throat> and there is a model. <clears throat> in California, in 2008 and 2010, with the support of that great left-wing liberal, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who put $3 million of his personal money into this, uh, two referenda were passed in California, setting up nonpartisan commissions to draw the boundaries for the state legislature and for the congressional districts from California. And anybody who looked at the 22 uh, midterms noticed that the California elections were extremely uh, competitive. Unlike many other states where you've got safe seats with 70, 80% of the vote going to one party or the other, in California, nearly all the races are competitive. And so we, you, you can honestly say that California is at least the congressional delegations. Uh, the state legislature is almost all Democrat, but that's really not because of gerrymandering. It's because of the nature of the state now. But nonetheless, we have a model to get past gerrymandering. And it was just actually instituted in Michigan as well. Uh, ironically, uh, Arnold's son went to the University of Michigan uh, and and um, so he got Arnold involved in the anti-gerrymandering fight in Michigan as well, and it actually had an impact. So we have a model. We want to end gerrymandering, and we and and we can do it the way it's done in California. Uh, statewide referenda. Uh, not all states have referenda. We want every state 
to be able to have a direct vote of the citizenry. And it should be decided, they're trying to make it by 60% now in some places, it's ridiculous. Every state should have the referendum and the referenda should be decided by a simple majority, absolutely. Um, ranked choice voting. We want ranked choice voting. We have Howie Hawkins on. When we, when we come back to the discussion, um, Howie is the great expert on ranked choice voting. Not all of us understand it. And uh, uh, so Howie will explain ranked choice voting for us. It is in, in place in Alaska, and I believe in Maine, and it, was, it definitely uh, shaped the congressional election in Alaska. So uh, we wanna have a clear discussion of it. We're almost to the end here. Um, uh, we haven't discussed this much, but we need to discuss uh, the, the idea of lowering the voting age to 16. It was one of the great steps forward during the Vietnam War of uh, the, the, by, Congress, by Constitution Amendment, the voting age was lowered to 18. It's clearly impacted our elections in a good way. And I don't see any reason why a 16 year old shouldn't be able to vote. Finally, abolish the electoral college. I mean, come on, it's so obvious. Uh, we have had um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, uh, um, Benjamin Harrison, uh, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump elected president of the United States, even though they got a minority of the popular vote. That cannot continue. There is absolutely no reason to have an electoral college, and we want, we want to be done with it. So that's the basic list. I think it's about 20 uh, points that we will be campaigning on from up to through 24 and beyond. Uh, we will have a discussion of these points uh, in a minute, but I want to now get to the other, <coughs> actually, those are all nuts and bolts issues on elections, but we want to actually have a, the other piece of our, the other shoe uh, to drop, which is our campaign is very focused on moving money that is donated by progressives to <coughs> uh, electoral campaigns we want that money to stop going to candidates and stop going to the parties and go instead to grassroots organizations to focus on get out the vote. And we have seen the impact of that uh, in Georgia, the Georgia miracle of 2020-21 and now the runoff of 22, where grassroots organizations led by the Georgia NAACP and the Center for Common Ground uh, brought out remarkable turnouts of the general public that would not have happened otherwise. And uh, we, we, it's our belief that through the discussions that we've had that um, the money that goes to the progressives tend to give the progressive candidates goes to a TV advertising that's 99% wasted, or at least 90% wasted. We wanted instead to go to the grassroots to su support democracy centers, and, and what we call relational uh, uh, campaigning where people are in the streets and knocking on doors and talking to people or making phone calls or sending postcards. Ray McClendon, are you with us? Ray, can we recognize you? Ray from the George NAACP. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, hello. So Ray, Ray McClendon uh, has spearheaded uh, the grassroots organizing in Georgia. Uh, at the first at the Atlanta NAACP and now at the state NAACP. And we have talked <laughs> many, many hours about this phenomenon of the tens of millions of dollars that go into TV advertising while we can't get door knockers paid. So Ray, can you give us a, a quick rundown on that? And then we're gonna double back and go through this list. And I'm gonna call first on Harry Hawkins to talk about ranked choice voting. But, uh, Ray McClendon, can you give us the lowdown on this, please? Absolutely. And, and one of the most important things to recognize is, is that, as a great politician once said, all politics is local. And uh, to, to control local politics, we see uh, the, a lot of the MAGA conservative uh, conspiracy theory buffs or beginning to try to, to control the ground game in local communities by taking over school boards, by taking over election boards. And the Democrats have not had a, a response to that. 
progressives need to do the same thing. And a part of that is to have effective civic engagement partners who, who are trusted uh, advisors, trusted messengers in local communities. This is what needs to be done in order to get effective messaging across. Uh, in many of these communities, especially in, in rural uh, Black communities across the South called the Black Belt, uh, in urban com communities, uh, 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 in metro areas like Atlanta and, and, and Birmingham and Charlotte, you are going to need messengers who understand what's going on in the, and we don't have that effective messaging. We have what I call a, in the uh, democratic establishment, we have something that I call the, the uh, political consultant industrial complex. They go from, from race to race, they make enormous amounts of money, and is predicated upon their so-called, you know, political acumen. The acumen is actually on the ground to understand what communities' needs are, what their pain points are, as Andrea Mitchell loves to point out, and then to come up with an effective strategy for letting those local folks know that we hear them and we are going to work with, with candidates who understand what their pain points are and are going to do something about it, number one. Number two, you, uh, uh, there is a lot of misinformation on the civic process and what really makes a difference. As we go around the state of Georgia specifically, we hear from a lot of voters who say, you only come around one part of the year when it's time for my vote, but I don't see anything changing in my community. And so a part of the strategy has to be a year-round, not cyclical, but year-round strategy of civic engagement, which the political, which the um, Democratic Party does not do. And so we we believe that the strategy that has been been employed by democracy centers that we have begun to employ through the Georgia Way and then Georgia Way 2.0, which went into effect in 2022 is a strategy that we're gonna put more infrastructure around beginning in 2023. And we're hoping to continue to have the support of, of all of the folks on this call and recognizing that the move toward 24 starts in 2023 to have the year round engagement that's necessary in order to uh, mobilize and energize the, the folks that need will need to be enthusiastic from the progressive side when it comes to the 2024 elections. There you go. So, you know, the, ten, they, the, the Democratic Party spent $50 million on the um, uh, runoff campaign in, uh, in Georgia. Um, the, the Republicans spent, I think, more than 20 or $30 million. Uh, Ray, how much of the money on the progressive side went to grassroots campaigning in Georgia? A very, a very minimal amount. Um, maybe, maybe a million, million and a half. I would estimate, and that, and that's, and, and that's just an estimation. Uh, you know, we were, we were imploring people to send funds for the basics of getting the vote out in many of our communities up to the very last minute. We, we got no funding from the Democratic Party. We got no funding from uh, any of the, the major uh, candidates in either the general election in Georgia or in the runoff. So, so, so the point of this is that, as an example, uh, let me give you a statistic here. In, in, the, in the runoff, 95% of African-American vote uh, almost a little under 95% of the African-American vote voted for Warnock. Why was it difficult for the people who supported Warnock to understand that if you amplify the message of nonpartisan groups that are targeting the African-American community, nine and a half out of 10 of those votes are your votes. 
and, and, and the messaging is coming from people that they know, and that's going to resonate much, much more effectively than from a, a campaign stump speech, even, even a speech, let's say, from Barack Obama. We, we, we love Obama, and that's fine. But, but, the, but the important point is to say, um, it, go back and read uh, Steve Rosenfeld's um, reporting that he did from South Georgia. And, and the point, and, and, and some of the people that he interviewed and, and some of the reporting that he did with people who were in the street, and these were folks who, who were community leaders who could touch voters directly on a multi-generational level. And that's what makes the difference in many of these communities. And, and, and for some reason, um, one of the major parties just does not get it. So what, what we're gonna be doing going forward is we're looking forward to an election 24 that has grassroots uh, campaigning. Uh, the, the groups that we uh, support now are we, um, uh, that we know of, <laughs> actually that are doing great work, are the Georgia NAACP and the um, uh, Center for Common Ground. Those are the two we've been working with. We hope to expand that list to a nationwide network uh, so that the tens of millions of dollars that progressives give, and we are progressive, we're nonpartisan, we are progressive, we support Republicans who are progressive and Democrats who are progressive and Greens who are progressive. But the, by the time we get to 24, and Wendy has compiled a list already, which Wendy, you'll, you'll I think we've posted in there, you can put a link in the chat uh, of gra 500 grassroots groups around the country. So we want to build this list. We want to make it available to the general public. And we want to encourage people to stop giving to the parties and start giving to the progressive movement uh, on the grassroots. Uh, we saw, for example, in Virginia, uh, a campaign um, where <laughs> the, the, the Democratic candidate would not pay his canvassers. This is a multimillionaire, for God's sakes. So the, the Republicans, Steve Bannon, seem to have gotten that message. I'm not sure that the progressives have. So just as we've been successful in spreading pa hand-marked paper ballots, hopefully we will be successful in spreading uh, the, the word on, on uh, grassroots campaigning. Uh, does anyone have a quick question for Ray before I go to Harry Hawkins for a quick tutorial on ranked choice voting? And then we're gonna open, and Ray Lutz on audits, and then we're gonna open it up. Uh, uh, Myla Reeson, go ahead. Myla, you wanna ask oh, something of Ray? Thank you, yeah, I do. Um, <clears throat> Ray, I was wondering if you have looked at uh, Mississippi, you know, Roger uh, Wicker is up in the Senate he and that seat is up and i know that it's a pretty tough race because it looks like he got like 60 percent of the vote last time and the democrat got 40. but i'm just wondering if the demographics have changed with respect to younger people now entering the um the voter rolls and whether um the it's about i think for about 40 percent of the um of the voting population is uh, African American or Black, and um, I'm just wondering whether there are enough uh, white progressives and young people to kind of make that race competitive in in 2024. If you've looked at that, uh, yes, and and let me just say, and you you raise a great question, uh, not just for Mississippi but across. Uh, the, what I call a Southern Crescent from Virginia over to Mississippi and maybe even Texas is, uh, and Andrea Miller has done some great um, analysis on this, that you look at all of the, the BIPOC pi populations across that Southern Crescent and we can form a coalition amongst the, the African-American, Hispanic, um, the uh, AAPI communities, Native American communities, uh, that we can control any election we want to uh, along with, with uh, progressive whites. Uh, the, the, the Georgia way is um, one of the principles that could be employed in all of these states. And uh, I'm pleased to, to, to see that uh, several of our coalition members have, have received calls from other states 
that that want to know how the Georgia way works, how the coalition building that we did works uh, to employ in their states. And the beautiful thing about that is that most of these states have the same elements. The seeds of what we did in Georgia are available. And what I mean by that is there are uh, divine nine black fraternities and sororities in every one of those states and play a major role. There are um, Prince Hall Mason uh, cha uh, chapters or lodges in all of those states uh, across, across the South. Uh, there, of course, are you know, faith-based organizations in all of those states. So, so the, the difference is that they have not come together with the strategy of the Georgia way. They have not looked at how to make that work. And so one of the things that we can do is hopefully help to export this, which was one of the initial reasons for even chronicling the Georgia way, was to say this can be exported, replicated in different states. And, and I'm glad to see that there's some interest in doing that. Uh, but with this group and others, what we can do is begin to let folks know uh, in these states that what was done in Georgia is not unique. It was just the will to want to come together and create that statewide coalition, set ego to the side, and become much more efficient and effective in the ground game that we want to employ. And, and so we can do it in Mississippi uh, if, if we decide that the, the, the leaders there want to employ something similarly. And, and we'd, love to, we'd love to go over and help. We would have loved to have helped as an example in North Carolina. There's no reason that um, uh, Justice Beasley should not have won that race in North Carolina, but for the fact that they were not as organized, in my opinion, uh, as they should have been from talking to some of the folks there in North Carolina. And so we need to we need to do that now in uh, going into 2023 and begin to use this strategy, which has been successful and, and put these resources, which are already existent, but are not working together to the maximum extent possible. Great, thank you. Okay, Ray, it's, it's fantastic to have you on. And what you've just laid out is a major piece of what we're gonna be doing for the next two years. It will be transcribed and available very quickly, Mary and Jeffrey, and then we're gonna to go uh, to Howie Hawkins to talk, talk to us about uh, range choice voting and then to bring lots about audits. Uh, Mary, really quickly, please. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to uh, uh, do, you, do you really realize that, uh, the, that um, election protection is a actually a global issue and that a uh, corporate world has united in attacking the world people globally simultaneously on all fronts and that we as a world people need to think reconsider what we're doing because we're all on different fronts attacking this and we're all just dumbfounded because there's just so much coming at us Absolutely. Wouldn't it be a good thing if we could find a way to create a global protection of our rights as citizens? Because corporate, okay. the corporate world is attacking us globally, both in the voting sector as well as climate line. Absolutely correct. I, I think, Ray, you won't have any disagreement with that. Uh, since we are on the internet, Mary, I, I, I want to. We'll send this everywhere, uh, and and you know. The, the, the world will look at George, the Georgia way and, um, and we'll spread it wherever we can. As you know, we followed very closely the election in, in Brazil, which thank God, you know, uh, we didn't wind up with Bolsonaro. God, that was really nerve wracking. So thank you for that, Mary, absolutely. Jeffrey, very quickly, and then we need to move. Thank you, Mary. Jeffrey? Uh, uh, this question is a reference to all, to the entire election. If it's not, if it's not that, then I'll, I'll hold go on ahead. to it later. Just go ahead. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because, because even if we did do all that stuff that you just said, have it all in place that you just said, Harvey, then what, what, how could we do? What's the point of it? If we don't have information about the candidates, you know, who they are internally, externally, who they, their experience well, and all that. 
okay, so the way it works is, uh, and this was pioneered a long time ago, there are no endorsements from candidates if you're taking 501c3, uh, no endorsements of candidates if you're taking 501c3 money, but you can, and Ray is a master of this, um, uh, put out a questionnaire and have them tell you where they stand. So it's a reverse. We don't endorse them, they endorse us. And, 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 the, and then you find out if they endorse a progressive agenda and you move and that, that way you keep your 501c3 and you don't uh, endorse a party. Is that right, Ray? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Harvey. And, and so let me tell you the, 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 again how that uh, flows into grassroots organizing. First thing you need to understand is what are the pain points of the constituencies and, you, and when, you, when you're dealing on a grassroots level, you find out what's important. This is not some focus group off in, a, in an Alexandria, Virginia uh, conference room somewhere. This is what's people on the ground in small towns in Southwest Georgia, in Northeast Georgia, et cetera, uh, and, and having connections to those, those local communities. And you come up with what the real issues are for those specific communities. As an example, here in Georgia, you, we had different issues in Metro Atlanta than we had in Albany, Georgia, in Coffee County, which is in, uh, in, in South Georgia, uh, in Lowndes County. And so what we did was we fashioned then messaging based upon those issues. Um, it, um, expanding uh, Medicaid, which would deal with, with, with the fact that hospitals have been closing in rural Georgia and, and, and different issues like that. I won't go into all the issues, but the messaging had to be tailored to those communities based upon what the communities were telling us their challenges were. And so then what you do is <clears throat> what we, we would take the, the nonpartisan, and there were many nonpartisan voter guides out. And those voter guides would go down, as an example, in the runoff and say, this is what Herschel Walker believes on all of these issues. Does he believe in expanding Medicaid? No. Uh, does he believe in reproductive rights? No. And you would go down the list, and then you would say, well, here are your pain points. Here's what one of the candidates says he, he wants. Here's what the other candidate then you make the decision on who you think would represent you best on those issues that affect you. So you do, you do, we do not, uh, as a movement, we do not advocate um, endorsing candidates. We advocate being endorsed by candidates and letting the voters know. And so that's our focus. And it's, it's, it's a 501c3, it's nonpartisan, and you lose ground when you endorse candidates. You endorse a platform and let them endorse us. Thank you, Ray. That's that's really generic, and that's exactly what we need done. Um, okay, so I'm going to move uh, uh, really quickly now. This has been fantastic. I'm so honored, uh, Ray, that you joined us. We've got Dennis Bernstein, so many other great people on the line. Um, uh, 59 people right now. Uh, we're going to go to Howie Hawkins. One a fairly obscure point on our list of uh, agenda is uh, ranked choice voting. And it's, it's new in the litany and uh, a lot of us don't understand it. It did have an impact in Alaska. Uh, I believe uh, Maine as well. So Howie, can you give, uh, Howie is, uh, was the Green Party candidate for president. Um, uh, we did not endorse him, but uh, he, he's, I've known him forever. Howie, tell us about ranked choice voting, please. Yeah, it's not obscure anymore. We had eight, uh, 10 ballot measures on the ballot in 2022, and they passed in uh, eight places. So going into 2020, there was ranked choice voting in about two dozen municipalities. Coming out of this election, we have it in over 100 jurisdictions, including three states, 20 counties, 78 municipalities, and 20 school districts. And for those that don't know what ranked choice voting is, it means you go in, and you vote by ranking your candidates in the order of preference. It's as easy as one, two, three for the voter. So Harvey, for example, was torn between me and Biden. If he was in Ohio, he would have voted for Biden, even though he's pro-nuclear. But living in California, he could vote for me because Biden was gonna win California. But for a lot of people, they have that vote splitting spoiler dilemma. 
Ranked choice voting eliminates that. Wherever Harvey lived in the, the election, he could have voted for rank B1, Biden two, and but, but, uh, Trump never would have got his vote. Now, the other thing you can do with ranked choice voting is get proportional representation by ranking your candidates from multi-member districts. And the end result is proportional representation of all the political parties. So you get a multi-party democracy and you eliminate gerrymandering because it doesn't matter where these multi-member district lines are drawn. Every party is going to get its proportional share of representation. And Harvey, one thing you said about independent redistricting in California, creating a lot of competitive districts, I just looked. Only five of the congressional districts in California out of 52 were competitive if you use a 5% margin. And that's similar to around, across the country. Across the country, there's only 37 out of 435. So independent redistricting commissions are not gonna get rid of non-competitive one-party districts where the elections are a farce because we know who's gonna win in the first place. The thing that proportional ranked choice voting gets, that's ranked choice voting in multi-member districts is fair representation of political minorities, which is not just Greens, it's Democrats and Republican districts, it's Republicans in Democratic districts, it's black people in white districts, Asian people in districts that are majority other. And in fact, the uh, municipalities that have adopted proportional ranked choice voting in, in, in recent years have done so under the threat of civil rights lawsuits because people of color in those communities were get underrepresented, whether, the, whether it was a district system or at-large system. So these communities include uh, black people in East Point, Michigan, Latinos in Desert Palm and Ojai, California, Asians in Albany, California, and in Portland, Oregon, where they got it passed in this election, it was all the peoples of color that got together and said, we're not getting represented in this at-large winner-take-all system. So they went to proportional rank choice voting. So what that does, it eliminates gerrymandering as well as the spoiler problem. Can you explain to us very quickly, because I know many of us are vaguely, uh, what happened in Alaska in the congressional district? What, what was the impact of rank, rank choice voting in that district? Well, it meant Sarah Palin didn't get elected. She had too high a negatives. One of the consequences of ranked choice voting is it doesn't pay to go negative because you want the second choices of people who prefer another candidate first. So you got to put your own position out positively instead of telling everybody what's wrong with the other people. So a lot of those Republicans that voted, I think his name was Begich, who yeah. came in second to Patola in the first round, most of them gave their second uh, choice to Patola, the Democrat, rather than Palin, because they were, you know, Palin had a lot of negatives. I mean, she quit in the middle of her governor's term in Alaska. A lot of those Republicans weren't happy with that. So what you get is the most favored candidate in the end, because what happens, the way you count the votes is, if nobody gets a majority in the first round, the last place candidate is eliminated, and their ballots are transferred to their second choices. It's Excellent. Okay. called instant runoff voting. And that so process I'm, continues until somebody gets the majority of votes. Right. And that's what happened in Alaska. And that, that would have eliminated the craziness in Florida 2000, uh, when everybody was screaming at Ralph, if there had been ranked choice voting, the outcome would have been different. Yeah, most of his second choices would have gone to Gore. Right. I so, think so. Leave Ralph out of it. Greg Palace got it right. They suppressed the black vote. That's, that's right. That's how they got Bush in office. Right. But they and the, but they also um, if in a three point in a three way election, when the second guy is, is the third person is uh, eliminated, then it has a different. So Howie, can you put in the chat and tell us where people can look up a uh, deeper um, understanding of, because it's going to actually become a very significant part of our elections, and it's very pro-democratic, small d, and we therefore support it, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna put four resources in there. Thank you so much, that's very- Some of them, very, a couple of them deal with the Electoral College as well. Okay, yeah, or the Electoral College, you know, disappears with ranked choice. But let me make one point on that. I mean, the thing I'm gonna put in there is an article from the Harvard Law and Policy Review, 
which says or argues that you don't need a constitutional amendment to get rid of the Electoral College. There are already provisions in the Constitution that give Congress the ability to regulate presidential elections. So you could set up a ranked choice national popular vote for president by passing a law and you wouldn't have to change the Constitution. But people can read that article for themselves. Yes, please let us know about that. We'll put it, it will also be posted at the website. Uh, thank you, Howie. We have one more presenter very quickly, um, Ray Lutz. Uh, we're also joined by John Brakey, who at the, at the next uh, session is going to tell us about a great court victory. <coughs> and people, I want to be, make it clear, this is not an academic exercise. We're not in this to get, have a good shot at it and lose. Uh, we intend to win on these issues, uh, however long it takes, and to protect our democracy. And I will again reiterate, it had not been for the election protection movement, and I'm sure Ray will confirm this, had it not been for, for paper ballots, uh, the outcomes in 2018, 2020, and 22 would have been very, very different. Ray Lutz, you're an expert on uh, auditing. Auditing is a big piece of the puzzle. We are gonna extend for time here uh, to continue to do this to make sure everybody's questions get answered. And then we're going to go to John Brakey, who just won a big victory this morning. Uh, Ray Lutz, you want to tell us uh, your views on very quickly on audits, because you played a major, major role with John Brakey uh, dealing with the Michigas in Arizona. And then we'll go to Susan, Susan Pinchon as well. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, OK, thanks a lot, um, Slago, and I appreciate everything you're doing here. Uh, I would, uh, a quick aside, everybody should check out Star Voting as another option, which is a little easier to count, uh, similar to ranked choice voting. But on to this thing about auditing. Now you're right. The fact that we have paper um, record, a paper record is so important because then we're almost done getting rid of the electronic only machines, but they still persist in some areas. So we've got to work to get rid of the remaining non-paper machines. So that needs to be a key item because that's still outstanding. Uh, the second thing is with regard to auditing, the main problem here with regard to uh, however they're doing it is that they are doing their own audits of themselves. The election officials are auditing themselves. And so what results is they tend not to ever find anything. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like asking people to pull themselves over on the freeway if they've gone over the speed limit, you know, call over the patrol officer and give themselves a ticket. Well, That's the, just, the, the, the word of the televangelist is that the word audit does not appear in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, it needs to be independently done. And so the way we can do this is to get scans of the ballots right away. Um, and let people count the ballots if they want to in the, you know, in the precincts or in the, in the uh, counties um, by hand. We need to do some of that no matter what. And that has to be under the control of the jurisdiction, but uh, because it's the, it's the critical paper record. But we can also do really good audits by using the images, and that can be done independently. So that's why I think having basically very much brain dead scanners would be the way to go where the scanners don't interpret the vote all they do is make images in in the precinct and then you're taking the ability of those scanners to manipulate the vote because they don't know what the vote is on them and essentially they're they're so stupid and it's kind of like i, I use the analogy of eagles um have really good eyesight but they can't read okay you don't want to teach the voting machines how to read the vote because then you're just asking people to be able to hack them and and change what the outcome is so that is where I, i'm kind of but that's downstream near term let me just give you the main agenda items for your list one get rid of all non-paper machines that's still not done second thing is to get uh ballot images and cast vote records available so that we can do independent audits um those are the two major things i think you should put in there Okay, thanks, Lego. Fantastic, Ray. And, and everybody, appreciate and, everything going on here. It's great. And, and, and by good. the way, call me Raymond, just so that uh, I know it's not Ray McClendon. So let's make me Raymond and make him Ray. Okay, thanks. <laughs> you guys look exactly alike, so it's it's hard to. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. um, I want to. Uh, uh, 
I, you got to understand that Raymond, Ray, uh, uh, <laughs> Raymond Lutz and John Brakeley absolutely changed the outcome in Arizona. We would be in a very different country had it not been for their auditing measures in, in Arizona. Uh, Susan Pinchon's in Florida. We're going to continue to do this for a bit. If you have questions, uh, I am going to, uh, and Ray underscore, between the two Rays, Raymond Lutz and Ray McClendon, we have, we have hit uh, grassroots campaigning and paper ballots, which are the two major um, uh, foundations of our work for the next two years.